you know, in myself I can't do anything but through you. I can do all things because you strengthen me. And so today, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, in your sight. And let me bring forth your word accurately and from the Holy Spirit of God to minister to the hearts of your people. And I give you praise, O oh God, and I give you glory. And all of God's people said, yeah. Amen. Amen. We are going to continue today on a new message I believe I started last week, and it's, it's called Trust in God's Timing. Trust in God's Timing. And we are going to be talking about patience. And I know that I asked it last week, but I'll ask it again. Anyone in this auditorium needs some good old-fashioned patience? Am I in the right church? Do we need patience? Yes. Thank you. I thought maybe I was the only one that needed patience. And maybe I need to get to this, to this altar and ask God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's turn in our Bibles, if we can, to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And we are going to read verse 1 through. 1 through 7, I believe. And this is the amplified, this is the amplified version of the Bible. Psalm 37. Do not worry. I could stop there and you can say amen and we can dismiss. Are you joking, Pastor? No, I'm not. That, is, that message, I'm joking, but you understand what I'm saying. That, those words, do not worry, should carry with you every day. Because the times that we are living in, there's times of great distress Great tragedies, great, there's, there's just so much that we could talk about in the negative today. But I choose to talk in the positive of God's word. Amen. As I said that, I'm saying this, don't worry. Because I do a lot of counseling, and it's not just in this church. It's with a lot of people outside of this church. And the one thing I hear through every conversation is the word worry. Worried about the future. Worried about what will happen. Worried about finances. Worried about the jobs. Worried about their health. And we go on and on. You can fill in the blanks. We don't deny the situations. We may, ha our, we may be believing God for healings in our bodies and our mind, spirit, soul, and body. You know, we, we may have, have, have situations going on with our, our, our mind and we need to cast down our imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in Christ. So I'm not putting that, making light of any of that. But what I am saying is, worry is like a rocking chair. You get plenty of exercise, but you don't get anywhere. And that's the truth. And that word needs to be under the blood and under your feet. And when you feel that worry and anxiety, it comes in all kinds of forms. Uh, depression, anxiety, overwhelmment. It's, it comes everywhere. That's when you say, no. No, I choose to walk in what God says about me. I choose to walk about what the word says about my problems. I choose to walk above the situations. I choose to be above the fray. The winds and the waves still know his voice. I love that song, Pastor Samalis. I love it. Because the winds and the waves still know the voice of God. They heard that voice. Yes, they heard Jesus say, peace. What? Peace, it's the very opposite of worry. Peace, be still. And the wind and the waves heard his voice. 
How much more does he hear you? Oh, praise God. I just preached me happy because it's the truth. Lord God, help us. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Well, I didn't get too far with that scripture, did I? Psalm 37, do not worry. <laughs> That's only got three words. Do not worry because of evildoers. And, you know, it, you can see evildoers and wrongdoers. All you have to do is turn on the news. They're all there, lined up. Do not worry because of evildoers, nor be envious towards wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. In other words, everything comes to pass. If we as Christians will pray the word of God over our circumstances, over our country, over this world, God can make an amazing difference to what we're seeing and hearing today. The these evildoers and people that want nothing but evil, and we see it. I mean, my God, how much more can we see of, of evil people destroying children? And it's just terrible, the things that we see in here. But we need to balance it. And God's been dealing with me about balance, it's very much so. And I know that if I'm getting it, so are you. I'm not saying we shouldn't watch news. Of course, we should keep abreast of the facts of this world. But I think we need to time ourselves and get into the Word, give, give the Word equal time. Amen? Amen. I remember a story years ago. It just came to me right now, and uh, I'll share it with you. It was Joel Osteen, or John Osteen, Joel Osteen's father, John Osteen, was at a, a meeting, uh, some hotel he was in, and uh, he was one of the speakers and what have you, and um, so the, they were going up in the elevator, and the elevator stopped, and these people get in, and uh, he was kind of pushed to the back. They were all coming all on, and, and they were cursing and swearing, and they had, we had, you know, under the influence of alcohol and what have you, but uh, he, he, uh, he, jumped up in the air, put his feet on the ground, stomped his feet and said, equal time, praise you Jesus, hallelujah, glory to God. They thought they died and went to heaven. They didn't know what happened, but they sobered up quick enough because that was a man of God that said, no, you want to swear, you want to curse, then I'm going to praise my God. And see, there is an answer to this, the problems in this world, and I'm looking at it. If the church doesn't rise up now, I shudder to think when it will. We have a voice, at least at this time in America, we do. I won't go there today, but we need to make our voice known and believe me, the best way you can make your voice known is on your knees before God and to reach as many people that are open to the gospel as you possibly can. God's got a plan for you. He's not forgotten you. He knows your address. He knows everything about you. He knew the moment you were born and he knows the moment you will go to be with him. Nothing, nothing is, is a, 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 God knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. So praise God that I can get through just reading the scriptures this morning. They will wither like the grass. Verse 3. Right, verse 3. Trust, rely on, and have confidence in the Lord. And here's three words. And do good. Do good. So the first three words I wanted you to remember was 37.1. Do not worry. 
That's the first three words. The second three words I want you to remember, and do good. Do good. When you do good, when your heart does not condemn you, then you have confidence towards God. Ask what you will. That's what he's saying here. He's saying rely confidently in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed securely on his faithfulness. Wow. I love that. Feed securely on his faithfulness. In your life, beloved, you will know you have, as I think I may have shared this last week, but if I have, I'm repeating it. There's people that will be in your life, one for a reason, a season, and a lifetime. And there's reasons and seasons and lifetimes. And there's times, I thank God for all of the lifetime peoples in this house. If you're, you're still with me or you're with Jesus and nobody could ever bless a pastor any more than I just said to myself with those words. I've been blessed by God to have the most wonderful people in my life. And so I'm saying something that's important. You have, you know, your people that you, you bless and that, that are there for a lifetime, a season, whatever. But then you've got people that walk out of your life. And these people may cause you hurt, may cause you wounds. You may, you know, get to the place where you say, oh, I'm done. Well, I've seen, I had a few people that agreed with me. Because if you live long enough, you will face these things. And whether it be in a church setting or your family or your workplace, people said this about you, your work and the, the boss brings you in and, and says da-da-da-da-da-da-da and you sit there, you're innocent, and you say, I never said that. Amen. Are you hearing me today? Amen. We go through life. And life happens while we're making our plans. Thank you, Jesus. So we need to feed securely on his faithfulness. Many people will jump ship, but many people will stay on board. Hallelujah. Give yourself a big, big praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Delight yourself. Now, I love this scripture. Delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, you're required to do it. God's not going to do it for you. He's saying, my people need to get into the habit of delighting themselves in me. Because I'll never leave them. I'll never forsake them. Lo, I am with them always, even till the end of the age. I hold on every day, beloved, to that nail-scarred hand. And I say, Jesus, what wilt thou have me to do today? He leads me by his Holy Spirit. He guides me by his Holy Spirit. When I open my mouth, before I open it, I say, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight and let none of my words fall to the ground. Either he's in charge or we are. What would you rather have? How many would rather have? Thank you. Because you know he will never fail you. You can fail, but he never will. So feed securely on his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. Listen. And he will give you the desires and petitions of your heart. Verse 6. Or is it verse 5? 5, 5. Yes, 6. Mm -mm, it's 5. Commit your way to the Lord. That word commit means exactly what it says, beloved. You're all in or you're all out. Commit. Make a commitment. I said it many years ago. If, if you do not make a, a, a commitment, in reality you're not desperate enough. 
You've got to make that commitment. I, I commit my way to you, Lord. I commit my ways to you. I'm making a commitment today. Kind of like when a couple comes to the altar to get married. And the ring goes in that finger and the other finger. And, and, and they say these words. What are they doing? They are committing to each other in a marriage covenant. What do we do when we read these verses of Scripture? Commit your way to the Lord. He already has a covenant with us. The covenant was, sh was, was sealed, was cut. Blood covenant and sealed in Jesus' blood. At Calvary. So our responsibility is to commit our way, our ways to him. He has a covenant with us. Do we have a covenant with him? Legally, yes. Do we walk in that covenant? You answer the question. Because it starts with commitment to God. And when you're committed to God, beloved, Everything else has its ways of falling into place. But I'm talking to you this morning about patience. You thought I'd forgotten, didn't you? <laughs> no, it's the one word we all love, isn't it? None of us want to be patient. We want what we want, and we want it yesterday. Especially in the United States of America. I say that with all due respect. You know I'm a Yankee doodle dandy. Hallelujah. All the way. But I see such a, a pace that we're living in. And no time to even think about being patient. I want it and I want it now. And many times we get it and we don't know how to get rid of it. I'll say no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Commit your way. Trust in him also, and he will do it. See, he's already committed his way to us. Now we can trust him. He will make your righteousness, that means your pursuit of right standing with God, like the light. What does it mean? It means that you'll be a light wherever you go. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your heavenly Father, your Father who is in heaven. That's what this is saying. He will make your pursuit of right standing like the light and your judgment like the shining of the noonday sun. And the last verse of Scripture, verse 7. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him and entrust yourself to him. Amen. Wow. That's another point I would like to make. It says you do it. You do it. You do it. To entrust yourself to him. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. Be patient. That's what Psalm 37, 7 is saying to us. We're all going through changes. I don't know one person in my life that's not going through a change. And actually, it's life. Quite frankly, when I walked into the office this morning and, and saw my, my three grandbabies, or great-grandbabies, um, I just look at them and say, when did you grow that big? <laughs> Hello? I just seen you a few weeks ago or whenever. And then I hear one, one saying, Mommy, I said, when did he say that? <laughs> Are you hearing me? So we're all growing we're all growing in stages through our lives. But what happens is we want to go ahead of it. And we're not ready. It's like these 
beautiful two little three little, little grand great granddaughter and two little great grandson it's like telling them hey i know you're not you're not old enough yet but do you want to drive home <laughs> but that's what we try to put on baby christians oh me oh my yeah anybody got any tomatoes out there i don't think so i'm teasing i'm teasing but sometimes the truth gets through and we need to be patient with each other and we need to understand where that person is they could be 60 70 80 years old and be a month old in the lord and that makes all the difference and they need to grow thereby just like all of us so we're all going through changes nothing comes easy but I'm here to tell you, as the pastor of this church, beloved, and please hear my heart, these are some of the most exciting changes that I will ever go through in my life, what I'm seeing happening here in this church. It is really exciting and very, very encouraging. But the one thing that we all need to get together on is we need to learn to be patient. Oh, these are great ideas. Oh, yes, Pastor, I want to do this. Oh, yeah, yes. Well, let's take time to pray it all through. Let's get the proper leadership in the places, and then let's see God move. It's a process. It's a process in your life. Everything's a process in your life. You don't just drive down a street and say, I like that house up over there, and you walk up. Excuse me, would you like to sell here? I'd like to buy this. No. Everything in life is a process. There has to be a sign on the front lawn first for sale. Then you have to make an appointment with a realtor or the owner to see it. But we, I don't understand today, I do understand today's society, I do, more than you think I do. And I'm sure that these, you know, the, the, the generation before my generation said the same thing about me. And our generation, I should say. And that is, well, we never did it that way before. Let me tell you the seven, dying, the seven words of a dying church. We never did it that way before. Change is inevitable. We have to have it. Beloved, I'm going to give you a statement that you won't believe. Someday I won't be here. I, I meant that joking but I mean it seriously. Someday, this church will have a totally different face, but it will still be God's church. It will still be what he planned in my heart to bring down to each generation. And so I am learning what I'm teaching you right now. I'm learning to expect to expect great things from God. But there's a process to everything. And everything that's w worthwhile in that process is hard work and patience. Patience is something we could all stand to have more of. We just don't want the tribulations that come along with it. If you and I are going to strive for patience, it's going to come with a price. And don't say I didn't tell you. You'll be tried and tested during the process of acquiring it. Patience, and I want you to hear this, and if you're taking notes, you might want to write this one down. Patience counteracts anger and keeps us content. Ever heard that one before? I'm going to say it again. Patience counteracts anger and keeps us content. Godliness with contentment is much gain. And when we are patient, 
we're able to focus on God's plan for our life rather than pushing through our own agendas. Too often, we try, beloved, to open locked doors because of our impatience. The message title of today was Trust in God's Timing. And if you don't, your attitude will soon go south. Blaming everyone and everything for your failure except you. Can anybody hear me? Amen. Beloved, I'm, I've been here. I've walked what I've just told you. I've had to get before God many times. And over these years, and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I went before you. I see that now. And I'm paying the price. But you know what? The God that I serve always is there in goodness and kindness for me. He's always there to say, good. You finally woke up and saw it. You know you're a determined one. That's how he talks to me. It's not the, thou, this. The, thou. No. He says, Pat, it's about time you got on your knees. It's about time you repented for that stupid, stupid decision. Is anybody here? Thank you. I know none of you have ever had to do that. I'm only talking to me today. And maybe a few out there in social media. You know better. So do I. We have all been there. That's what I love about the anointing God put in my life. It's called two words. Be real. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's my anointing. I never had this... And I'm for education one million percent. I see my grandchildren being raised up in colleges and all these other things. We couldn't do that in my day. I left school at 15. One day later I was working. Working. In a city bakeries. Up at four, four o'clock in the morning to get there from, for a van that came down from the big city Glasgow to our little town of Ayr with all of the bread and the buns and the cookies and the sugars and all the other stuff. When I say sugars, I mean desserts and all these things. That's how I started my life at 15 years old in a month. So I never had this education, education. What you hear me say from this pulpit is nothing more than the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. I've had to sit at his feet to learn these things. And again, I'm for all education, as long as, of course, it's to the benefit of your soul and it's, it's good and wholesome. I'm for all of it. I just never had that opportunity. But I refuse to sit down and, and, and feel sorry for myself and say, I can't do this, I can't do this. You can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth you. You can do all things through Christ. Don't tell me you can't, because God's saying you can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth you. But you need to make the decision. You need to understand that life is all decision-making. And the decisions you make today is for your future tomorrow. Hallelujah. The day that I left Scotland, I had no conception, none whatsoever, of what my future held. My husband, as you know, got saved first, came home to me. And I, you know, literally, I went, as, I mean, I, I was not the best wife in the world for a long time. 
I don't even want to get into all the details, but I really thought he had lost his mind. And he wasn't taking me down that road with him. Until God got a hold of me. Don't you ever, ever, ever give up praying for a family member. Never. <laughs> Never. His arm is not too short that he can't carry them. And his eye is not dim that he can't see them. Oh yes, the God you serve, the God I serve, is faithful. God's timetable, if rather God's timetable, isn't matching up with ours. As humans, we try to take matters into our own hands. And when we do this, we inevitably end up failing because we're focusing on our will and not his. Our will and not his. Well, Pastor, how do you know the difference? There's many ways you can know, but the big one for me is my ways, meaning God, my ways are peace and pleasantness. And if you don't have peace and pleasantness, you better pray again. And if the decision you make brings brings trouble and, and agony and, you know, deception and all these negative, negative, negative things to other people, that's not peace and that's not pleasantness. So get before God again. I could give you many examples, but that's the best one I have. I follow after peace inside of me. And if I don't have that peace and that nice, pleasant feeling, that's the only way I can describe it, beloved, then I stop right where I am. And I say, something's wrong with this idea, isn't it, Lord? It's a good idea, but it might not be a God idea. Am I ministering to anybody in here today? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's the same in the business world. Everything you do, you should follow after peace and pleasantness. What decisions you have to make, especially if you're in managerial position and you have to deal with people every day. You have to be in prayer before you deal with them. Start to see their, their needs instead of all their faults. That's a big one. This world is a needy, needy world. And the thing it needs more than anything is to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And God can put you... God can put you in places where he can open doors for you without you being foolish about it. Just wisdom. And you can lead many, many to Christ. As I hope to get to some time today. We'll see. It's time is really going on here. Hallelujah. But God's, if God's timetable is not matching yours, don't take things into your own hands you will end up failing. Here in Psalm 37, 7, we see that this verse is a good reminder not to get frustrated. That was the word I was looking for earlier, in slow times. But to await, await on God. Wait for an awakening from God. Hallelujah. When you're on an airplane, the captain usually comes on and says to sit back and enjoy the flight. Beloved, the same is true with patience. Sit back and enjoy your life. It's the only one you've got. Because God will get you to where you are supposed to be. So be still and know that he is God. Be still and be patient. He goes before you with faith in your heart and patience in your heart. You will make it. You will. If you feel today like you're about to lose hope, faith, patience, and everything else. 
and you don't know what to do, could I encourage you? In 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 4, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul was a man of great faith. And he says these words, We are hard pressed, which means troubled, on every side. Yet we're not crushed. You know, I stop for a moment just to think of what we're hearing every night on television. It describes this. This is the state the world is in. But Paul, this was personal to him. We've hard, we're hard pressed. We're troubled on every side. Yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. All of us have felt like Paul did at one time or another. This is the faith that Paul lived. He didn't just talk about it. He lived it. It says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Being distressed, listen to this, is when the stress and pressure on the outside get on the inside. Uh -huh. Can I say that again? Being depressed is when the stress and pressure on the outside get on the inside. It is possible to have stress come against you, but not be distressed by it. We should be too blessed to be stressed. Hallelujah. Perplexed is not being sure what to do. He says, but be not, but not in despair. Despair is when you don't know which way to turn. Ask God and he'll show you what to do. He'll show you how to have the victory through patience. Faith doesn't say you never have any trouble. It says faith, trouble, excuse me, doesn't have me. It's funny, when I was looking at my notes last night, I was thinking about a marching song that I heard played many times on the wireless, the radio. We didn't have television back then when I was growing up, very young after the war. But it was a, a marching song that kept the morale up with all the troops. And they'd have a, they'd, they'd have a kit bag. If you don't know what a kick, uh, excuse me, <laughs> it, it was called, um, uh, um, okay, kit, K-I-T bag, a kit bag. And it went over their shoulders as they were marching. And this is the song, a little bit of it, I don't remember at all. It says, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag. Brother, it's, oh, I forget what the rest of it, but it says, keep on smiling. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile, so... Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Now, you can't leave here and say, services at Fair Havens aren't different. <laughs> because they are. Amen. They're led by the Holy Ghost. Amen? I can have all the notes in the world, but at the end of the day, I'll obey God. So faith doesn't tell you that things will never happen. It says, I'm going to win. Jesus is on my side. I will let this attitude be in me, which was in Christ Jesus, and I will do it by faith. And in 1 Timothy 3, it says, in the last days, whoa, and we're in them, there will be trouble. The devil is trying to defeat us and to destroy us. 
First Timothy 4, 1 says, In the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. Well, that's history. Hallelujah. I've seen that. I've seen too much of it. And God bless America. Whenever we're going through a trial, your faith is on trial. The devil is trying to, dis to dismantle you and trying to damage your faith, especially when you lose faith in your God. The truth is, if you depart from the faith, then the great trouble in the last days, the hard to bear problems will defeat you because you won't have your faith to strengthen you. God has provided us with something to handle the stress and the trouble, the ability to walk by faith. Faith. Oh, hallelujah. Faith in God. And adjust, if you need to, your attitude to walk in it. There is no better way to get out of stress, to handle, uh, or to or handle, to get out of, of the stress of handling people and problems, than to believe God and obey Him. I'm all for counsel, beloved. I do it practically every day of my life on a telephone, for the most part. But I lead those people, even leaders. I lead them. It's time to get, and I say the same thing. It's time to get in your face for yourself to get before God. You need to hear God for your answers. I can pray, but I can't give you the answers. And people, as long as there's people, beloved, there's going to be problems. And they need to learn. And the kindest thing you can do is turn them to God. Help them as much as you can and then turn them over and say, I've done my part. Now you need to hear from God and I'll meet with you or I'll call you in another couple of months. See how you're doing. Or a couple of weeks or however the series, the situation might be, it might be shorter. But we can't do for people what God has already done on the cross. They need to be able to grow at their own pace and we as Christians need to mentor those that we can. Are you getting anything from this today? Praise God. In the last days, trouble will come. But all things are possible to him who believes. Faith will come. The devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. We know that, but Jesus said, I've came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Oh, glory to Jesus. Thank you, Father. I'm going to be closing up in a moment. The title of my message once again, Trust God's Timing. Trust His Timing. One person, one person can make a difference. God wants you to trust him. He has a purpose for your life. The important thing is that you obey him. Hear him. We read in Ezekiel 22, 30, I looked for a man among them. Or you can say, I look for a person among them. I looked for a person. One person can make all the difference. Listen to this, beloved. In 1858, a Boston Sunday school teacher named Kimball began visiting one of his students at the shoe store where he worked as a clerk. Eventually, he led him to Christ. That student's name was D.L. Moody. 21 years later, Moody, now an evangelist, visited London, and a great spiritual awakening took place. F.B. Meyer, a local pastor, went to hear Moody, and his life was transformed forever. 
Later, Meyer went to America to preach, and in one of his meetings, a student named J. Wilbur Chapman got saved. Chapman became active in the YMCA, where he met and discipled a former baseball player called Billy Sunday, one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived. Sunday became a great revivalist, and in one of his crusades in Charlotte, a group of businessmen came to Christ. A year later, they decided their city needed another crusade, so they invited Mordecai Ham to be their speaker. After three weeks, Ham left town, discouraged because he had only had one convert. Are you ready for this? The convert was a 12-year-old boy named Billy Graham. Yes. God's ways are higher. He knows the end from the beginning. The beginning from the end. He's Alpha and Omega. He knows every part of your, your future. He knows every part of mine. Billy Graham, one Sunday school teacher started it all. One brother, Andrew, led another brother called Peter to Christ. And Peter brought multitudes. One woman, get this, one woman whose name he still doesn't know led David Yonge Cho pastor of the world's largest church at that time when this was written was many years ago, 800,000 members. She led that man to Christ and he didn't even know her name. That's, if I can say anything, keep on keeping on, <coughs> excuse me, and trust in God's timing. I'm done. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Lord, I give you the applause. I give you the praise. I give you the glory. I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart that they are acceptable in your sight, my God and my Savior. And Father, I just thank you now and I praise you now. Have your way in all of our lives. Have your way, Jesus. If you're here visiting today and you heard this message and you've never really committed your life to Christ, you may be here and you may say, I, I, I love Jesus and I've lived a good life, Pastor Pat. Do I need to do any more? Yes. Just a simple thing. Just say, Jesus, come into my heart. I'm sorry if, if I've hurt you in any way. I'm sorry if I've sinned, oh God. But I ask you, Jesus, please come into my heart. I want to be born again. I want a new life. I want your life in me. If you're here today and you've never said that prayer before, never even thought about it really if that's you just raise your hand I, I, for the, all these lights I can't see back there but somebody will see if you raise your hand and put it back down again we have pastors that will come and talk to you after the service and so now Father as I graciously and gratefully give you all the praise I dismiss this beautiful congregation. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. Go with Jesus. He's going with you. Pastor Bob, thank you. Just wait for one more. Yep. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Great message, Pastor. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, as Pastor said, uh, 
the services at the Fair Havens are gloriously different. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that weren't here during the announcement time, uh, we're planning um, to have um, 